Welcome to the Metal Voice. First time on the show. First time. First time. Adrian Actually, Vandenberg. I got to correct that statement. Actually, Adrian, <laughs> Neil Turbin, who uh, works with us on the Metal Voice, he interviewed you at the uh, last Ronnie James Dio uh, oh, event. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, that was right. for the Metal Voice. That was Neil Turbin. He's the man on the street in Los Angeles. So that was a oh, great right. interview. Yeah, yeah. Hey, so, new I mean, album. This is a... A real what? treat, Adrian. I mean, I've been a fan since the very first album, Vandenberg. In fact, I liked it so much, I went on and got two copies. All right. Great. You got to spare so, one. Uh, hey, case, yeah, uh... let's, let's bring us up to news here. What's, <laughs> what's happening? Is this a Vandenberg <laughs> album, a Moon Kings album, a White Snake in the Making <laughs> album? Yeah, you never know with me, you know. It, I could be, uh, I, I'm all over the place, basically. So it's released, it was released just a few weeks ago, or two weeks ago, maybe. Uh, it's called Sin on Mascot Records. So what's the difference between this album and the one you did with Ronnie Romero uh, in 2020? What, what would be the difference in, for the fans? Um, I realized I, I was really happy with the 2020 album, and I, I still am. Um, but uh, when we started doing, a, when we had a bunch of live shows under our belt, I realized I, I would like to try to get a little closer to how we sound live with them. So I turned everything up a little bit, a little bit more um, oomph out of the amplifier, a little more, bit more punch on the, on the drums, just a little bit more of everything, and go a little heavier. And it came, it came out really handy that uh, I ran into Mats, because as you can tell, he, um, he sings with, a, with an incredible amount of intensity. So that really help making this album um, uh, a much heavier than uh, the 2020 album. Okay. Who, who's the lineup that plays on this album? Uh, the lineup, the, the rest of the band is the same, you know. Uh, I had to stop working with Ronnie because our schedules didn't match anymore. Um, as everybody knows, Ronnie, Ronnie takes on quite a lot of projects and he lives in Romania. So in Romania, uh, they were able to um, to start taking on stuff a little sooner than we were in Holland uh, after COVID. Um, they were a little bit more free, so to speak. And, and, and so in England, the same thing. We, we did shows in England already before we were even allowed to do shows in Holland. So that was pretty weird. Yeah, yeah. And in terms of, if I say this sounds like Whitesnake, what do you, how do you react to that? I put this on, I go, is this David Coverdale singing here? Is this... This sounds very heavily Led Zeppelin, Whitesnake influenced. Or maybe well, that's just I'm, Vandenberg. Or maybe that's just Vandenberg. Go ahead. Well, um, uh, first of all, I'm really happy that uh, you don't think it sounds like like a Britney Spears album. <laughs> so, so that's great. And of course, you know, uh, more people have mentioned that, of course. Um, there's two things that uh, um, influence that. Of course, I was with Whitesnake for 12 or 13 years. And David and I wrote a couple of albums together. And... Even before that, when I joined Whitesnake, David said, man, there's a couple of songs on the, on the, on the Vandenberg albums that could have been Whitesnake songs or the other way around. And one of the reasons why he wanted to work with me was the way uh, my songwriting, uh, he mentioned it many times, also in an interview. So it's very logical. That's the kind of music that flows out of me naturally. Um, even the band I had before Vandenberg, a band called Teaser, we never really got outside of Holland and Germany, but um, that that is very close to um, the earlier Whitesnake, like Whitesnake in the late 70s and early 80s. Uh, very blues-oriented, heavy rock, basically. Uh, so, And then, of course, as you can tell, um, Mats, the vocalist Mats, is timbre, his tone of voice, is definitely not far away from David's tone of voice. So you put one-on-one -on -one together and, you, and you've got like a an album that logically um, doesn't sound too far away from White Snake. So when you're writing these songs, whose voice do you have in, in your head that, to, to, to sing along? It, yeah, you know, it's um, I, I've always written um, with Paul Rogers' voice in mind and David Coverdale's voice and Robert Plant's voice. Those kind of blues-based rock singers have always been my favorite, you know, and, and, and still is still the case. Um, for me, um, like as good as they are, uh, singers like Stephen Piercy or Vince Neil, you know, they're great in in the LA style of rock. But but I'm Euro European, as you know, and 
my heroes have always been uh, bands like uh, Jimi Hendrix, Cream, uh, Led Zeppelin, Rainbow, Be Purple, uh, Humble Pie, and um, on top of that, an American band uh, like Mountain. That was a big influence on me. Yeah, well, Leslie West was a big influence my play my playing. And they were basically like the American answer to Led Zeppelin or the other way around, or who knows, you know, but it's uh, all my roots are in, in blues rock, basically. And and I give it a little bit of a classical twist here and there because, you know, there was classical music in the house when I grew up all the time because my sister is a classical piano player and my dad played classical piano and jazz um, all the time. So when I had my first Marshall stack in my tiny uh, bedroom, that's when the sound in the, in the house of Vandenberg changed drastically. <laughs> let, let me ask you this. So I'm listening to the sound. The guy, you know, he, the Matt sounds so much like David Coverdale and Robert Plant. And I guess that's what you're hearing in your head. Yes. When, when, <laughs> now I forgot my question. Um, <laughs> did you ever veer off and have any other voices like a, maybe a, I don't know, uh, Rob Halford, or, you know, you ever have any other inspirations to go down that road, like more of a power metal? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, um, there's definitely um, influences in, the, in, the, in, the, in this album, you know, uh, for instance, the song Sin and the, the song uh, Out of the Shadows, they are, it could have had a singer like Rob Halford on it, or Ron James Dio, uh, another favorite of mine. Um, it's definitely um, a step further than what I the kind of stuff I wrote in the early Vandenberg days. Yeah. Um, but uh, for a song like Baby You've Changed, um, where I wrote the lyrics and the vocal melodies as well, um, like I used to do in the early Vandenberg days, um, and the 2020 album, actually, um, I can imagine somebody like Steve Perry on that one, you know? Oh, yeah. uh, Steve Perry is another favorite singer of mine, and um, um, he could definitely make that song his own. Definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, you know, I'm listening to, like you mentioned, Out of the Shadows. I'm listening to that. I'm like, you know, why don't you just get David Coverdale uh, on the thing? I mean, that's how close it is. Is Are you still in touch with David? Oh, yeah, a lot. Uh, as a matter of fact, just uh, earlier today, uh, we had a, an email exchange. Uh, we became really, really good friends, as, as everybody knows, and we're always in touch. Sometimes it's like a, a month and a half in between when he's touring, and sometimes it's like two times a week, you know? So um, we... We became instant friends when I when I hadn't even made up my mind to join Whitesnake yet. Um, uh, we we have so many um, similar influences in our in our growing up and our, our music and especially our sense of humor also because there have been periods where I lived in David's house for about uh, three quarters of a year uh, to the extent that uh, we started calling calling me um, poltergeist because. This was one of my aliases when we were on tour, you know, whenever you're in a hotel, you you use an alias for your um, for your room um, in order to not get bombarded with fans knocking on your door. So one of my aliases was Paul Tergeist. Yeah. So I get a, like a wake-up call in the morning and uh, Mr. Tergeist, uh, there's a, uh, this is your wake-up call. <laughs> <laughs> How much... So I'm looking at Wikipedia and I see Restless Heart and, and there's a there's a statement there and I want you to clarify this. You started doing writing sessions with David Coverdale on Restless Heart and Coverdale, it says that Coverdale kind of was presented with songs that sounded like Chicago and Poison. Is there any truth <laughs> to that? Is there any truth to that? I never heard that, to be honest, you know. It's, so uh... Their sessions, this is what it says, Adrian, but their sessions broke down after Vandenberg allegedly presented Coverdale with songs more suitable for Chicago or Poison during the Restless I, I, Heart era. I don't think so because we wrote those songs in David's house. So I don't know where it came from, but it sounds funny though. <laughs> so you never gave him songs that sounded very pop-like and uh, AOR-ish? Uh, you know, it, it 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 could be because I write very melodic stuff, you know, and that's how I come up with a ballad like "Burning Heart" or like "Baby You've Changed," you know, and they could probably be covered, and not by Poison, because that's definitely not a singer. Uh, Brett Brett Michaels is definitely not a singer in this vein of songs, but um, 
Chicago, I don't know. Who knows, you know? I mean, I, I, I always, David and I always agree on the fact that a song, a song, a song should, should be, a song is a good song when it can get dressed up in whether it's country or western, whether it's a big band, whether it's whatever. It makes the song stand up. Uh, if you if you look at a song like um, like Yesterday by the Beatles or like um, um, uh, Frank Sinatra songs, Elvis Presley songs, here I go again. You know, I mean, I I I, I think there are country and western versions of a song like Here I Go Again. Um, uh, it's a great song, and if you put the horns. Uh, behind it, it could be a Chicago song. I don't know, you know. <laughs> All right. Yeah, All right. Did you ever? Did you ever meet the um, Bernie Marsden? Unfortunately, he passed recently. Were you? Yeah. Ever, what was his said, as, as a guitar player? How would you describe him? Well, he, he's a great classic, classic rock guitar player. You know, he was really good in the early White Night. He, he was a great songwriter because he co-wrote. Here we go again. He, he co-wrote. Poofy Love and like a whole bunch of those old Whitesnake songs, uh, classic Whitesnake songs that were so strong that um, Geffen wanted um, David to re-record them on the 87 album. And we recorded, as you know, uh, Poofy Love on the Slip of the Tongue album. So, a good, like I said before, you know, a good song is a good song no matter how you dress it up. When you were transitioning from, when you were writing uh, with uh, David and then they transitioned to uh, Steve Vai, did you guys work to get, uh, what was it on, what's the album? Uh, it was Slip, it was of, the Slip of the Tongue. Slip of the Tongue. You were doing writing sessions with with, with uh, David Coverdale. And then, of course, it, your accident prevented you for to doing the studio work. Steve I took over. Was there sort of like a writing, co-writing together those songs? or No, no, that no. Uh, they, no, Dave and I already finished the songs and I played um, the guide guitar, as it's called, the guide rhythm guitars on the, on the basic tracks. Uh, in order to get a picture uh, for David, for instance, and for the producer involved, what the song was going to be like and what the approach would be. And then this wish problem came up, so I had to leave the session. And um, uh, as you can imagine, when I, um, that, uh, the Slip of the Tongue album, sonically, in my mind, uh, I pictured it like the Sin album. Uh, we were just talking about it. The whole Sin album could could have been a lot of the songs could have been on the on the Slip of the Tongue album, you know. That's how I write, and that's how I record my guitars. So, um, if people want to have an idea how Slip of the Tongue would have sounded with me playing on it, um, you should listen to the, the Sin album, and, and you have the full picture. That's a good way to do it. Yeah. And I just have, I'm going to clarify something. I got Modern Popoff's book, and in this book, Sail Away, it's alluded to that Keith Olsen said. He kind of refuted the risk problem that you, you just spoke about. Is there any truth on that? And I've never heard this from anybody else, but uh, reading this book, I was a bit in a shock. So I want to take advantage and ask you that to clarify once and for all, if there was uh, any doubt that there was a risk problem that, that kept you from recording that album. No, no. But the thing is, Keith doesn't even know, but he wasn't uh, involved in that uh, stadium yet. Um, we were working with um, Mike Klink. Um, and Steve, uh, um, Keith Olsen was involved later. He he didn't know. The other thing is, it, it's contradictory with what he said earlier. Um, I don't think he said it because um, when I recorded uh, the guitar parts for Here We Go Again, that was done in about um, half an hour, uh, we recorded it. Um, I, I came up with the arrangement for the cleaner sounding guitar. The guitar solo was done in about five minutes. Keith was raving about it, you know, and he said, man, 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 um, it's a pity you, you, you couldn't be involved with more stuff on this album uh, because it is a, it's a great combination with the, the work that um, um, John Sykes did. It would, would have been a great combination, he said. I agree because uh, Sykes and I have a very different style and just like uh, with Steve I and me uh, during the tour, um, Everybody loved the the, the 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 two different styles blend together. It's exciting for an audience to have two guitar players that don't, don't sound similar. Otherwise, it doesn't really make too much sense, you know, to have two guitar players apart from the, the sound that you double the rhythm guitar parts. Yeah, fine, you know. But um, yeah, I said it was. Uh, I don't think he said it, you know, to be honest, because um, he was very complimentary in earlier interviews too. 
um, when it it was about those sessions. So it's very easy for people to write something like that down and then keep passed away, you know. So uh, yeah. And you just okay. mentioned Steve Vai. So is there any truth, like Vivian Campbell's uh, belief that you didn't want a second guitarist in the band? You wanted to be the sole guitarist in White. No. No, it is very, um, I, I, I heard those stories too, uh, interviews. The reason why um, Viv, David uh, wanted to stop working with Vivian was 80% of that was uh, Vivian's wife. He divorced her, so I can't say it now. At the time when they were still married, I couldn't say it, but she was a pain in the ass for everybody, for, for um, the sound guy, for the light guy, for our tour manager. She she kept going up to the sound guy and go, oh, my husband is not loud enough in the mix. And then she went to the light guy, my husband doesn't have enough lights on stage. And then she she was, oh man, uh, ask Jimmy Ayers, the tour manager at the time, you know, they were so fed up with her. And the other 20% was that um, um, the, the the ideas for the song, that, uh, the song that Vivian presented to David, David uh, didn't think they were suitable for Whitesnake. He said they were more uh, suitable for bands like you too, or like something else, you know? And Vivian got offended by that. And, and that's why, uh, what happened, I didn't even know Vivian, um, uh, that David told Vivian uh, that he didn't want to keep working with him until uh, our tour manager, Jimmy Ayers, uh, he came to my room and he said, well, Vivian is not in a band anymore. I said, oh, well, I, I, I enjoyed playing with Vivian. I had, no objections about anything and um, uh, Whitesnake was always a two guitar band you know um, as you know uh, so after that you know it was a com coming and going from guitar players it was uh, Warren and Martini that I really enjoyed playing with Warren uh, of course it was Steve Vai and then it was Steve Ferris in, in the 1997 tour I didn't care you know it's, it's all fine by me uh, um, I was always being a when I grew up, I, I listened a lot to um, the Honor Brothers, two guitar bands. I was a Finn Lizzy fan, two guitar bands. I was asked to join Finn Lizzy at some point, um, and that was a two guitar band. I didn't say, no, I'm not going to do it. I want to be the only guitar. I don't care, <laughs> you know, <laughs> as long as it's good, you know. And I thought Vivian and I were a good combo. But did, when, did, did, when did David cover their first become known here. I've read that he wanted you in the band even before John Sykes. And then in this book, John Kolobner says, oh, until I put this dream band together for the videos, David didn't even know Adrian existed, which I found hard to believe. So, uh, well, David didn't even know I existed? Yeah, apparently John Kolobner in, in this book said that uh, the only reason he was aware of you is because of the videos that he put his dream band together for the videos. And I thought he, question, was, he knew you way before that. The question is... Uh, did you know you were asked to join White Snake before John Sykes, correct? Oh, yeah. Oh, oh way, yeah, way before. And, uh, and I, that's and it. The first you time, were asked, and then you said no, right? That's how it went. Well, you tell yeah, us. It, yeah, the first time was in 82, and uh, the Vandenberg, first Vandenberg album was about to get released. Um, and uh, David mentioned in an interview, um, uh, I always read his interviews because I was a fan, uh, an interview in one of the English music magazines, I think it was Melody Maker, and he said, well, and the next, um, I've got a new guitar player, um, an unknown Dutch guy called Adrian Vandenberg. And I read the interview and go, what? I didn't know about it. And a couple of weeks later, David invited me to come to um, a Weissnick show in, in Holland, in Utrecht. And he invited me backstage. I got picked up by um, his tour manager. I said, oh, David would like to meet you. And David uh, suggested, you know, um, um, to, to join Weissnick. I said, well, man, I'm, big, I'm a big fan. I can't do it because th th this album is coming out. I signed a contract with Atlantic. I can't, you know, stop the band. So, and the second time was um, around the, the um, Slide It In album. David was recording it in uh, in München, Germany. And um, I got asked again. And, uh, and I was, uh, actually, the second time was um, um, when Whitesnake was headlining the Donington uh, Festival in England. And again, David uh, um, invited me backstage, and he repeated his um, his um, invitation. As, uh, but I was recording the second Vandenberg album in Jimmy Page's studio again. I said, "Man, bad timing again. Let's stay in touch." You know. So the third time was when he was recording uh, the uh, Slide In album, 
uh, I got a call by his um, manager, and he said, so, um, how's the situation right now? I said, man, I'm recording the third Vandenberg album. I can't, you know. It, it, it was always when I was recording another Vandenberg so album. So you refused David Coverdale three times. That's what you're saying. Yes, he didn't like it. Uh, but... Uh, <laughs> You know, uh, I, I didn't like it either because David uh, is one of my all-time favorite singers, you know, uh, just like Robert Plant and, and, and Ronnie Dio and, and, and Paul Rogers and, and those guys, you know. Um, but we both knew the timing uh, wasn't right each and every time. So in 86, when John Kalotner, um called me up and he said, well, I, I heard um, you, you got out of your contract with Atlantic. Uh, I would like to invite you to come to um, to, to LA to talk about the new contract for White uh, for Vandenberg. And he said, "Yeah, great." You know, so I got I, I was flown to LA and I got picked up by a limo. I go, "Wow, this is a life," you know. So um, <laughs> um, the next day I was in uh, Colombo's office and he said, "Well, I haven't been quite honest. I actually have two proposals for you. One is to um, to fire the rest of Vandenberg and to put together." a new lineup for Vandenberg in Los Angeles with a couple of top class American or English musicians. I said, well, yeah, well, it sounds interesting because people had mentioned that same thing to me before, the people from Atlantic and our American manager, Ken Adamy, Ken Adamy, who was the manager for Cheap Trick. They, they kept repeating the same thing. They didn't think the lineup was good enough. Um, so uh, I said, well, what is the other proposal. He said, well, I would really like you to join Whitesnake. And I said, well, I've heard it before, you know. Um, <laughs> do you mind if I think about it for a couple of days, you know? Um, I, I had to put a picture in my mind and then um, said, well, while, while you're here, I would like to ask you to come up with a different guitar arrangement for Here We Go Again and to play a Vandenberg style solo on it. Because um, the way John Sykes recorded it, he says, uh, Colonna said it wasn't radio friendly enough and it, it made him think of a country and western song played by a metal band. Oh, so, so that's literally what he said. So I thought, I said, great, because I love the song because I knew the song from the first recording um, when, when I was in England recording the, the, the first Vandenberg album. Um, Here We Go Again was a huge hit in England in the older version, in the classic version. And I thought, man, what a great song. I heard it in the clubs in England at the time. Um, and of course, uh, David Singing was my favorite since since he joined the Purple, actually. <laughs> so I thought that was a great idea. So um, I told John, of course, you know. So that's when I worked with Keith Olsen. And uh, I recorded the whole thing within half an hour. There you go. Yeah, um, that's amazing. And, and, and Keith said, that that's great because... Um, apparently, John Sykes took almost a year for all the guitar parts on that album. Yeah, I read that. <laughs> He's so a little slow. He, He's a little slow. <laughs> yeah, you know, but it was apparently a difficult process. You know, David had a problem with his sinuses and all the stuff. It was like a pretty complicated album. But fortunately, it paid off because it cost a lot yes, of money, as you yes, can imagine. Did, did, did. So Keith was really happy. Man, he's in half an hour, you know, this, this is great. Um, uh, and they repeated his compliments. So that's why I think it's bullshit, you know, what was in the, in a book. There's, there's two I, I bands. Wish, there, I, I the, wish it would have been like a made of story because I, w I would have kept playing and picked up my playing a lot faster than I was able to do, you know? Yeah, yeah. There, there's two bands. You toured with Ozzy and you toured with Kiss. And these are two bands that have always different guitars. Did you ever get asked by Gene Simmons or Ozzy, Adrian, join our band, join our band. I I'm, I'm bet you you did, but you're just, you haven't said I did. anything. You did, I did. by which one? Uh, um, it was a story that I never told before, but it was, <laughs> you guys got a premiere. Um, Ozzy, actually, um, the first yeah. time I met him during the tour when we started, but I must say he was not quite sober. Um, which is unusual for Ozzy, of course. Which is very unusual for Ozzy, of course. But yeah, you know, um, his tour manager introduced me to him, and um, he was in a lunchroom of uh, one of one of the hotels, and and you know, he he said, "Hey, do you want to join my band?" As a man, you know, we're supporting you guys, and um, and Jake is a fantastic player, and 
and uh, he mumbled something like uh, we'll stay in touch or whatever you know but uh, later on um some people uh, mentioned uh, that um uh, Don Airy and a couple of other guys in the band um, mentioned to Ozzy that uh, my style of playing had a lot of resemblance with um, Randy Rhodes is playing in the, in the sense of classical influences like Euro metal type of stuff combined with American and, and blues and whatever, you know. So um, hearing that and hearing uh, Randy's playing because I was not really familiar with Randy playing because Ozzy was not popular in Europe at all at the time, you know, he was huge in the United States. So when we got the invitation to support him, um, I was kind of surprised. I thought, wow, Ozzy, you know, um, uh, I didn't really know he was that huge in, in the States. Is that in 83? Are you saying in 83? That was yeah, when... in 83, yeah. Yeah, it was the tour with um, Jake uh, on guitar and uh, Tommy. That's how I got, uh, I got to know Tommy. Uh, I didn't. I couldn't expect that I would end up playing with Tommy. Uh, Tommy a couple of years later, and um, this the, the the bass player was a weird guy. He, uh, Rudy's name again? Bob Daisley or Rudy Bob Sarzo? Bob no, no, because I, I got to know Rudy in the same tour when when Quiet Riot was supporting Vandenberg when we started headlining the tour. Uh, Quiet Riot was supporting us at a couple of California shows. And I became instant friends with Rudy, and I still am friends with Rudy. Um, it was, uh, what was his name? He, he, he was into self-mutilation or something. He, he, you know, he, he had bloody hands when he played oh, the bass uh, and all this. Don Costa. Yeah. No, but, but Don Costa was ultimate sin, though. Uh, well, he was on the tour. Yeah. What, what, wait a second. Was that, a a, on the back was that the guitar? Was, so that was that was on the Ultimate Sin tour that Vandenberg opened up, not on Bark at the Moon. No, no, no. It was. I don't think it was um, Bark at the Moon. Uh, um, but um, Don Costa played bass on that tour. So I don't. Maybe um, maybe he went uh, you know White Snake style and had a different lineup uh, for um, for the tour. I don't know. But uh, right. yeah, yeah, Don Costa was uh, the whole bit that we played. Don was uh, doing the bass, okay. basically torturing his bass. Uh, it was more like it hurt on the back of his guitar. Uh, all right, I guess yeah. we're, we're, we have time. I guess the last question is sharks. Sharks. Where did the sharks come from on the albums? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, when I made the painting for uh, the second Zanderberg album, um, I painted this. Uh, I, I was. When I was at art uh, university uh, for five years, um, when I when I started, uh, I've always been a huge fan of Salvador Dali and, and surrealistic paintings and realistic paintings. Um, uh, I got the idea for, for making a painting with those sharks flying over the highway towards somewhere. So when I made the painting for the, when I made the the painting for this album, I thought it would be great to have a connection with that and made the, the sharks fly into New York, the city of sin. And the second name of uh, New York, as we know, is the apple. So there's a connection with the snake and the apple, my past with white snake, and the original sin, of course, Adam and Eve and the, and the apple and the snake. So that's the whole picture, basically. <laughs> Fantastic. I love yeah. the sharks. I just love the sharks. They stick out. Unfortunately, our time's up, so it was too good to speak to you and, and big fans like forever. So I'm really glad Thank to you very much. Show today, Adrian. Thank you very much, man. And if there's any more questions, you know, get in touch with Steve um, and, and uh, at some point we'll just uh, continue yapping away. Well, we'll <laughs> Thank you up on that so sure. much, Adrian. Thank you so much. My pleasure, man. My pleasure. Take care, guys.